Everybody, we want to welcome you to joining us for today's service. My name is Ryan Lamberson. I'm the campus pastor at our Word of Life Highland Colony campus. And I'm joined this morning with my beautiful, incredible, amazing wife, Elizabeth Hope. Actually, she does not like the name Elizabeth. That's kind of a joke we have between us, but I'm joined up here with my beautiful wife, Hope. And today we are continuing our series on a timeless love. And this is part two. And so part two today, we got an opportunity to share with you about how to have a timeless marriage. And so we've been married this coming September for almost 18 years. It'll be 18 years in September. So I know there's a lot of you out there that may have been doing this longer than we have. And some of you, maybe you just got married, but we wanted to kind of share with you a little bit about our story, a little bit about our journey, and maybe share some tips with you today about how to have a marriage that will last and how to have a timeless marriage. But before we do anything else, we wanna take a moment and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just come before you today. We thank you for the opportunity to open up your word and share. Father, we thank you for all the relationships out there, all the marriages. And Lord, we thank you that today that we'll all just receive what you have for us today. Thank you for marriages being strengthened. Father, thank you for families being strengthened. And Father, we thank you that as we hear your word, that we just not be hearers of it. But Father, I thank you that we be doers of it as well. And because of that, our marriages will be blessed. And Father, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning, we're going to talk to you about how to have four ways to have a timeless marriage. And we figured it no better way to kind of start off the message today with telling you a little bit about how we met. But the funny thing is, is uh, we kind of have two different stories about how we thought that we met. Mine is a little bit more spiritual and I hope we'll get a chance to tell you about her side of the story here in just a second. But as I remember it, it was a a hot summer day and um, Hope was best friends with, with my sister and uh, during that time she had come into town to stay uh, with my sister for a night and um, I got a chance to talk with Hope for a little while and hang out with her for the day and during that time I remember thinking to myself, this is I think the first person that I've ever met that is a Christian that has got this much joy, has this much peace about him and the truth of it was in my heart I was like, this is the type of person, if this is what Christianity is all about, this is what I want. Because she had such a glow about her, such a life about her that I was like, this is amazing. I've honestly never met anybody like this before. And, and I still remember that day. And uh, so after we hung out for a little bit that day, me and my sister, we had a conversation. And uh, she said, so what do you think about hope? And I just got real quiet for a second. And I looked at my sister and I just didn't have words. And I said, you know what, April, that's my sister's, and I said, April, I think she's the type of woman that I wanna marry one day. And my sister looked at me and she was like, mouth wide open, wide eyed, she said, why would you say that? She is way too good for you and you do not have a chance. And so that's kinda how I remember that story is just being marked by seeing somebody for the very first time that was just truly amazing. So, babe, what's your side of the story? Yeah, my story is totally not spiritual. I know probably some of you that know me personally, you're thinking, what? How can it not be? The only part that I think is spiritual is obviously the Lord told me, kind of confirmed in my heart, like what the Lord did with Ryan, like this is the one you're supposed to marry. But I'll take you guys back to that night when I was spending the night with his sister and I woke up early the next morning and as I'm coming down the stairs, their house kind of made like a roundabout where you're facing the front door and the windows and in doing that, you know, I saw this guy outside and he definitely got my attention because for one, his shirt was off. Um, so I was like, who is this hot looking man out here? And lo and behold, like I didn't stop. I mean, I'm human. So I walked all the way to the front door, peered through the windows and he was outside washing his truck. And I was like, oh yes, who are you? I want to meet you. And so ended up seeing his sister. She comes down the stairs and she's just staring at me like, what are you doing? I'm like, there is a good looking man outside the front door washing his truck. Do you know him? She's like, um, yeah, that's my brother. He's younger than us. I was like, 
<laughs> anyway, like, tell me more about him. So, needless to say, that's how um, I met Ryan, and that is our take on our story. You know, baby, as you were talking about that, I couldn't help but think that in that time in your life that your priorities were just way out of order when it came to looking for the right person to marry, which brings us to our first point today about how to have a timeless marriage, and that is, is a marriage that we have got to learn to prioritize. And I want to read a verse of scripture to you today. It's in Mark chapter 10, verse 7 through 9. It says, for this reason, a man will leave his parents and be wedded to his wife, and the husband and wife will be joined as one flesh. And after that, they no longer exist as two, but as one flesh. So there you have it. What God has joined together, no one has the right to split apart. You know, as you get married, you realize that there's no other relationship in our lives that should be elevated above the marriage relationship except that of our relationship with God. And that our spouse has got to be number one all the time outside of our relationship with God. And you know what, as I was thinking about this point, I couldn't help but think about how nobody likes to be in second place, especially in marriage. And when I think about second place, I think about being in ninth grade. I was playing on a baseball team. It was the Florida Marlins. We had the Marlin hat, we had the pinstripe, baseball uniform, all this kind of stuff. And I was playing on a team with some guys that were a year older than me. And so it kind of stumped because I was on the bench a lot that year, but we got to the finals. We got to the final game. Whoever won that was going to be in first place. And you know what? I still remember to this day, it just marked me in a negative way because I missed the last ball that was hit, causing the other team to win the game. And they finally got me off the bench, finally got me into the game. And when you guys, you know what? We took second place. And there was no grins. There was no excitement. There was just a lot of upset teenage guys because we got second place. And you know what? Nobody likes to get second place when it comes to sports or anything else in life. But the truth about it is, as especially in marriage, nobody wants to be second place. Our spouse never wants to be second place in our lives. Uh, whenever we get married, we've got to realize that there's a lot of things that can take place that could kind of get in the way of our relationship. And whether it's hobbies, whether it's friendships, or whether it's our career, or whatever it is, there's all these different things that can kind of compete against our time when all the time what we need to be focused on is how do I make my marriage relationship a priority? And there was a time in our marriage, you know, it was probably about seven years ago by this point that I really got into exercise and I, I did this fitness competition. I started doing bodybuilding. And for the first time in a lot of years, I kind of did something just for myself. And I was having a good time. I was loving life, living my best life. I was in the best shape of my life. And for about two years there during the evenings, I'd go out, I'd go work out with friends and I was training for this and I was doing all this. But during that time, we had our second son, Lake, and so you can imagine, hope is at home during those two years, during the evenings while I'm out with my buddies working out. And during that time, my priorities, they, they honestly, they kind of got out of order. There was a time there where, you know what, my, my spouse, my marriage, it, it kind of took second place on some of those evenings rather than where it should have been in first place. And during that time, Hope was extremely patient with me, but I still remember to this day vividly being in our bedroom and she said, hey, I need to talk to you for just a minute. And guys, you know, whenever your wife says that to you, like, do you have a second we need to talk? Like, this is probably not gonna be like the most positive conversation, but she was real patient with me and she said, hey, you know, um, you're, you're gone kind of a lot during the evenings and um, I'm super excited for you. I'm glad that you have something for you, but you know what you do have here? You've got me and you've got two boys here at the house and it's gotten to be kind of tough. And your priorities, honestly, they've kind of gotten out of order. And in that moment, I realized I needed to make an adjustment there. And as I did that, the marriage got better, the family got better because I made my wife and my spouse a priority again. Yeah, if you're a mom or a dad and you're watching online or you're here with us today, you know, whether you have small kids or teenage kids or whether you have more than 
one child, maybe you have three kids like we do, or maybe you even have five or six. If you have five or six, wow, props to you. You're killing it out there, I'm sure. Um, but I can say that, you know, when it comes to prioritizing your marriage and making sure that your marriage falls right under your relationship with the Lord, like you still have parent duties you have to fulfill, right? Whether you have one child or four or however many, but at the same time, the thing that we have seen in our marriage and we are still growing in this, y'all, is you not only have to make marriage a priority, you have to make marriage a priority above your children. And I know that sometimes is a deep, like, thing to swallow, but honestly, you know, when it comes to raising our children, we have to train our children that there are boundaries in this marriage, yeah. and there are boundaries not just within this marriage, but also in how we parent our children, and when we're parenting our children, we want our children to not only know what the boundaries are, we want them to respect the boundaries, and that is huge, and if we don't teach our children the boundaries of respecting our marriage, that it is a priority under the Father God with our relationship with Him, then we're not going to have a marriage. That's just truth be told. If you want your kids to respect your marriage, we're going to have to teach them what it is okay and what is not okay when it comes to prioritizing. Now, it doesn't mean that you neglect your children, their needs. I mean, us having three boys, I feel like there's a need like 24 seven, like yeah. except for maybe when I'm sleeping. And if one of them gets up in the night, there's another need. Yeah. So it's not that it's not going to continue where your children are gonna continue to need you. And even in different seasons, it is our responsibility to make sure we're not neglecting our children and having needful conversations with them, but we're helping them navigate life. We're meeting their needs, we're loving them but we're doing it in a way that they know, okay, when it's mommy and daddy's time or they're sitting in a room alone or whatever that looks like, I need to respect the boundary and wait my turn. And when they see that and know that, you begin to have a greater appreciation for your spouse, but you, your kids begin to have a greater appreciation and understanding of what a marriage should look like. You know, um, I love this quote, and I read this actually in a marriage book that I just finished up. And it says this, don't sacrifice your marriage for your parenting. That is huge because so many of us do this as parents where we're like, well, I got to do this and I got to do that and they need this and they need that. And that's a mistake that we have to kind of look at our priorities and say, you know what, mommy loves you, daddy loves you, but right now I need this time with my spouse. And, you know, we've had to go through different seasons, like where our kids were small. There's a season for that. Now we've got these boys who are turning into these men. One is close to approaching teenagers. I can't even believe that. And we've had to do some practical steps with prioritization to make sure that we are keeping this in check. You know, before, like when we had three boys, it was like, okay, we are going on a date night every Friday night. And we were so solid at it. Like we would do it every single Friday night. We had great people that were just like helping us out that loved our children because that does matter. You want people to watch your kids that actually love you and have a heart for you and your family. And um, so we were doing that, but as time went on, the seasons began to change. And we found ourselves where we kind of lost what that priority for scheduling a date night was and how to do that, where it was like once a month, sometimes two months would pass by. And so during a season change, we had taken advantage of our Friday mornings we drop the kids off for school and we're like, it's our time now. If we didn't get the date night in, then we're like, we're gonna go and have coffee. And so you have to find ways in your marriage to prioritize it, but also in your marriage to make sure your kids know what the boundaries are and that they respect what those boundaries are. No, I think that's a great point because the, you know there was a time for us where it was like, we felt like if we couldn't get out to get a date that particular weekend where it was like, man, are we really prioritizing the marriage? Are we really making time for each other like we need to if we can't make it to a restaurant, go see a movie, and just like have several hours together during that time? But you know what? For, for us, uh, it's wonderful when we can do that, but I personally enjoy, and I think that it's something we both really like to do, is we both love drinking coffee. And so just the ride to Starbucks, 
having a really strong coffee after you get the kids dropped off for school and just talking about how is your week? Because you know what, during, during the day you can ask some questions here and there, but actually to have time for each other where you can actually listen has made all the difference in the world for us. And sometimes you gotta let yourself off the hook realizing that you can't always take that short two day trip or you can't always take that date on a Friday night, but you, what, you, what you can do is, you know, you can make time where you can make time. And sometimes that is just coffee or go walk around a store whatever it is and so our next point actually that leads into that is the second way to have a timeless marriage is to have good communication and I want to read a verse of scripture out of Proverbs 18 21 it says death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it and indulge in it will eat its fruit and bear the consequences of their words you know, as I think about this with communication and marriage and, and looking at this verse of scripture, it says death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I know a lot of us, we probably have heard that before and you're like, yeah, that really is good. And I need to say the right things. I need to say the, not say the wrong things. I need to say the right things at the right time and, and all these different things. But as I look back at our marriage in almost 18 years, I can remember times in our marriage where I've done really well with it. And I have spoke words that have brought healing. They have brought peace to a situation. It's brought strength uh, to our marriage and to our family and different things like that. But you know what? There's been plenty of times where I've missed it and I've made mistakes and I've said things that uh, I shouldn't have said. And I can remember those moments where, you know, life was busy. And, and guys, I think that you can relate to this. And, and I know wives can too, where if you had one of those busy weeks and it's just been stressful, there's been a lot going on, and then you get home, and maybe the kids are there, and the kids are crying, and then the dog is barking, and you got all this stuff going on, and the kids are like, mommy, mommy, daddy, daddy, and the, the dog's running around the house, and just, you're tired, you're worn out, all these things are happening, and all of a sudden, you're not thinking about the scripture in Proverbs 18, 21, about my words are life and death, and you know what, you're stressed, and somebody asks something the wrong way, and you just, oh, there you go. Something comes out of your mouth, and you're like, oh, God gosh, as soon as you said it, you realized I should not have said that. That was the wrong thing to say in that moment. You wish you could get your words back, but you can't. But I think to have good communication in a marriage, we've got to realize that our words carry so much power in them. And I think a word that is wisely chosen can bring so much healing into a situation and it can bring so much healing into a marriage and it can bring life and it can bring peace but on the flip side of it, if we get into that cycle where we never take a step back and realize I haven't been saying the right things, I've not been saying it with the right heart and the right spirit about it, we can get into this vicious cycle where it's just like, I keep saying the wrong thing after the wrong thing after the wrong thing. And what happens to that is it begins to bring this death or this decay or this worsening of the marriage relationship. And so we've gotta have strong communication. And I think one of the great ways to do that is this, is that we've gotta speak life even when we don't feel like it, even when we're tired, even when we're worn out, and even when we're stressed, we've gotta to choose to speak words of life because that's what's gonna make the marriage last. Yeah, it makes me think of that phrase, and maybe some of you have heard this, where communication, whether it's through a spouse or you and a child or you and a friend, communication is a listening, not just a hearing. And I have come to know this so true in my life where, you know, when someone is talking to me or I'm talking to someone, then I don't want them to just hear me. I want them to tune in and listen. You know, my kids are even like this with three kids. You know, they're like, mom, like there's three of us. And I'm like, they're all talking at the same time. And I'm like, there's one of me, three of y'all. And it's truth in even in a marriage where when we're trying to communicate something, maybe it's through something in our heart that we want to communicate to our spouse or whatever it is. Like we want our spouse to not just look at us and nod their head or look at us and they're looking at their phone nodding their head, right? Amen. We want our spouse to engage in conversation with us through communication by listening and not just a hearing. And, you know, when I think of this, I think of James 119, and it says this, my dearest brothers and sisters, take this to heart. So even when I read that last phrase, take this to heart, it's like God's like, hey, I need you to pay attention on this. Yeah. Like, I just don't want you to hear with your ears. I want you to hear with your ears, but hear with your heart. That's a listening and not just a hearing. And he says this, be quick to listen and slow to speak. 
The Amplified says this. It says, be a thoughtful listener, a speaker of carefully chosen words. Now, I'm a woman, obviously, and I like to talk. Like, I mean, I meet most women, and we do like to chit-chat. We do like to have us a good time. But one thing that I am seeing, even in my communication with my spouse, is this, is I need to slow up on my words rather than just spewing out whatever I want to say however I want to say it no taking heart to what James 119 says mean rather than just speak in your mind even though you are tempted to want to speak it now and speak it how you want <laughs> in communication like I need to think before I speak I need to pay attention to that and it's so funny y'all because we laugh about this like if you know Ryan or maybe you're kind of getting to know Ryan or maybe you just know him from watching online Either way, Ryan and our kids have him down to a science. Like, when it comes to communication, we know that Ryan is like, okay, I don't want to know the details. Like, I just want you to get to the point and drive it home because he is a problem solver. Like, he lives to say, what's the problem? Here's how we're going to fix it. Now let's do it. Okay, he doesn't want to think about it and keep rambling on. And I'm over here like, hey, I have this story, and I want to share with you all the details, like what they were wearing, how they looked at me, like what's really going on at school, you know, all these different things. And he's like, get to the point. <laughs> and so we joke about this, that, babe, you yeah. need to focus on being a little more patient and doing a listening, mm -hmm. not just a hearing. No, that's so good. I, I joke with people all the time because patience has been one of those things in my life that um, I, I'm still growing in and uh, year after year. And I felt like whenever we had our first son that God gave me that child because he was like, Ryan, I think that you need to learn some more patience in life. And uh, after we had Max, our oldest son, I, th I think that the Lord looked at me and was like, guess what, buddy? You're still not quite there. Here's another child and, and gave us Braden Lake. And um, you know what? I, I got better after each child, but I feel like God was like, you're close, but you're still not where you need to be. So here's a third child and gave us Jagger Woods. And so uh, with each child, I've learned more and more patience, but I had to come to the Lord after the third child and say, dear Lord, please, three kids is enough. I promise to you that I'll be patient. No, that's, that's a joke, but with each kid, I really have learned more patience, but hope is exactly right. That that's something I've had to grow in to just take time and listen to the details. And that's part of communication and really making it a priority to, to listen to our spouse. And for me, another part of communication that I've had to learn, and guys, it has taken me way more years than I care to admit, but sometimes communication happens through body language with our spouse. Because I'll come home from work some days, and Hope doesn't even have to say anything, but she says a lot with the look on her face, or maybe how she's standing that particular day. And that look is saying something very specific to me, and that is, is that... Guess what, Ryan? When I pick those kids up, they've been pretty wild, they've been pretty busy, and I need a break. And you know what? There was years where I, I saw that look and I was just like, hmm, I'm hungry. I need to go get a snack out of the, the cupboard and just sit down and take a break because I've been at work all day and things like that. But I've slowly picked up on, now I can pick up on the body language when she's trying to communicate to me without even using words, and that is this, is that, guess what? Those boys of yours, they've been kind of giving me a hard time, and you should probably go pick up dinner tonight and give me, the mom, a few minutes to myself. So by the time you guys make it back home, I'll be in just a better place mentally. And so picking up on body language, I want to encourage all the guys out there to pick up on some of those things because sometimes she can be saying something without even using her words. And you know what? I think that she enjoys it personally, whenever I can pick up on those things and her not having to say, hey, I need a break. But I think as we do that, it can make a big difference in communication. And uh, so that's just a little tip for the guys out there. Our next point, and this is our third point on how to have a timeless marriage is course correct. You know, we've all been in these seasons of marriage, whether you're newly married or, you know, 18 years or however that looks like for you, where you're going to have to have some hard conversations, yeah. right? Hard conversations are never fun, really. Like, I mean, nobody likes to have 
a hard conversation. Um, and through our marriage, we've had some hard conversations along the years of 18 years of being married. And sometimes through these hard conversations, um, there may be a season where you see your spouse is drifting. And I know what you're thinking, like, what does that mean? Really, it can mean anything. It can mean drifting spiritually. It can mean drifting from yourself and giving you attention or your kids' attention or whatever it may be. And when I think of hard conversations, you know, and even a season of drifting, um, I think of a story about my dad. You, you know, some of you may know my dad, and he was like this mighty man of God, a great preacher. He was like my very best friend. I was totally a daddy's girl. And um, anyway, we would always go to the beach like every summer. It was our favorite thing. And we knew that every single summer we were going to go down to Destin, Florida. And we like stayed in multiple different, you know, condos and stuff along the beach. Even to this day when we're driving by, Ryan loves it. Not really when I do this, but I'm like, we say there, we say there, we say there. This memory's there. And he, every year he's like, I know where you stay by this point. Like it's 18 <laughs> years. I got it. You went to the beach and you loved it. But what I'm trying to say is one day my dad got this raft and he decided he loved to sunbathe. He had this amazing like golden tan when he sunbathed. I was like, man, I should have got that gene. But he would out, go out in the ocean, and he grabbed this float, and he just kind of told us, like, hey, guys, I'm just going to go out here and chill and relax some in the ocean. So we were like, great. Y'all, hours and hours and hours went by. We didn't know where he was. We didn't know if he got eaten by a shark or what. Like, we were tripping. We didn't know what was happening. And so, of course, my mom is in full-blown panic mode, and Come to find out, a ship actually tipped him over. He was so far out. He was so blistered by the sun, but he still made it back. He just didn't realize how far he had drifted. And in a marriage, it's really easy when it comes to us needing to examine ourselves and examine our lives where we see that we're going to have to make some adjustments to make sure that we don't drift and our spouse doesn't drift in a marriage. You know, some signs of drifting are this. It could be distance. It could be silence. They're giving you the silent treatment, which is terrible. It could be they're less affectionate. They're not even paying attention that you're in the room. Disinterest, they're impatient. And I always say this, and I've had this quote with people before that were going through different seasons of life, is hard conversations lead to better outcomes. They just do. If you're willing to have the hard conversation, it will lead to a better outcome. You know, in Revelation 2.4, it says this, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. This is actually Jesus speaking to the church of Ephesus. And he's like, because you have left my first love, you've abandoned your passionate love for me, but remember where you are and where you had fallen. Repent and return to where it all began. I love this scripture and I love how Jesus is painting this picture of a relationship with him that he's like, hey, church, I know that you love me. I know that you want to do what's right. I know that you don't want to forsake me and drift your relationship with me. But he said, you know what? You've fallen. You've drifted away from me and I want you to know that you can return. Yeah. We serve that God that's like, even in a marriage when you drift and you have to have a hard conversation, he's like, I want you to come back to where it all began. I want you to have this relationship with me because I am for you. I love you. I believe in you. And I think that is such key in a marriage that when it comes to course correcting, even a small adjustment, it doesn't even maybe necessarily in your situation, it's not a big adjustment. But a small adjustment, God is saying, I want you to return to your first love. Because honestly, if we're not returning to our first love of how passionate we were for the Lord at the yeah. beginning, then really we're going to drift not only in our relationship with Christ, but for sure in our relationship with our marriage, our kids, and so on and so forth. No, that's so good. As you were sharing that point and we were getting ready for uh, this message, the Lord reminded me of uh, something that happened years ago. I, I had a friend, we'll call him Jim, because nobody knows Jim, but we'll call Jim. And Jim called me one Sunday morning, and it was one of those phone calls that I wasn't expecting to get. And, and honestly, it kind of it caught me off guard. And, and Jim called me and basically said, 
hey Ryan, um, I got into this big argument with my wife. Um, it was small to begin with, but it turned into something big. And I'm actually at a hotel right now. He's like, I, I can't be at the house with her right now. It just got, it got really heated. And he said, Ryan, I'm ready to be done. He said, I'm, I'm ready to be done with the marriage. He said, she, she keeps bringing up my past. I've said I'm sorry. I've tried to do the right things. And one thing led to another. We got into another disagreement. And I'm just ready to be done. I don't want to do this anymore. And Jim had been married for a lot of years at that point. And I'm there in that moment, and I'm like, God, give me a word for Jim because he needs me to say something intelligent and really something that will help him in this moment other than, gosh, Jim, that's really tough. You know, that's just going to fall short of what Jim needed to hear in that moment. And so I was like, God, give me something right now. And uh, what he spoke to my heart to tell Jim was this. is In, in 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love him because he first loved us. And so I told Jim in that moment, I said, Jim, I know you're upset. I know you're in a hotel right now. I know that you're ready to give up on this thing, but something you've got to remember is this, is that you've made plenty of mistakes too, Jim. And I've made plenty of mistakes as well. And we do it day after day, and we do it time after time. And the God that first loved us, that we've got to show that same kind of love to our spouse. And I said, just like Jesus has forgiven you whenever you've missed it time and time again, and he's forgiven me when I missed it time and time again. I said, Jim, you've got to go back home. And you've got to forgive your spouse again because not only has Christ forgiven you of your past, but he's going to continue to do it in your future and all the future mistakes and all these different things. And I told him, I said, you've got to do something in this moment right now. You're emotional, you're frustrated, but I said, you've got to adjust your heart. You had to adjust your heart, Jim. And the way you've got to adjust it is this, is you've got to look at how God loved you first. And you've got to show that same kind of love to your spouse. And that's going to be the beginning of you getting back on track and course correcting in your marriage relationship. And I said, not only that, I shared a scripture with him in James 5.16. It says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. So I said, the first thing, Jim, is this, is you've got to adjust your heart. You've got to be open enough for God to do something in this moment and in this marriage. But the second thing is, is you've got to go home and you've got to confess your faults. You've got to say, you're sorry. You've got to say, I, I made a mistake and our marriage means more to me than this disagreement and this argument. And whenever you do that, Jim, the Bible tells you that there will be a healing that takes place in that marriage. And you guys can begin to get back on track. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to feel great. And you may not even feel like you're wrong in this situation. But Jim, if you adjust your heart and you go to her and you confess and say, I'm sorry, that that will be the beginning of restoration in that marriage. And that leads me to our, our final point that we wanted to share with you on how to have a timeless marriage, and that is, is that we've got to forgive. There are gonna be those moments and there are going to be those times where we, we get our priorities out of order, or we communicate and we say something that we shouldn't, and we need to course correct. And when we get to those times, yes, we need to adjust our heart, and yes, we need to say we're sorry whenever we've made a mistake, and we need to be peacemakers to begin with, but we've gotta forgive our spouse, and we've gotta forgive ourselves in the areas that we've made mistakes. And I want to share this verse with you in 1 Peter 3, verse 7. It says, Likewise, husbands, dwell with them, with your spouse, according to knowledge. Give honor unto your wife as the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. If there's one thing that the enemy wants you to do in your marriage is that is this, is that rather than course correct, the enemy wants to come in and cause you to just remain and stay seated in unforgiveness. And the Bible says that the devil is a thief that comes to steal, kill, and steal in our lives, but he does the same thing in our marriage too. And whenever we let unforgiveness just stay there and we don't make an adjustment in our hearts and we don't confess and say we're sorry in those moments, what that story could have been is that Jim just gave up in that situation, in that marriage, but he didn't. He adjusted his heart. 
He confessed and said he was wrong. He went back home. And now, years later, they've got an amazing marriage. When I see them together, they always have so much joy and so much peace. When I'm around them, they make me laugh. They're just an incredible couple. And what the enemy meant for evil, God turned around for good simply because Jim made the decision to forgive. Jim made the decision in that moment, rather than to let the enemy have his way in their marriage, that he was going to forgive his spouse, and that allowed for healing and life and wholeness to come back to that marriage. I love what you just said about forgiveness is a decision. You know, it's a decision that you and I have made yeah. multiple times in our marriage, and it's a decision that all of you out here watching are going to have to make in a marriage, in with your kids, in any relationship that you may have. And it's a daily decision. It's a daily choice. You know, when unforgiveness is there, not only does it create tension and distance in these things, but it also creates an opportunity where you can, like, see it on someone's face, yeah. you know, if they're not forgiving. You can tell by their tone when they open their mouth, like, they have not forgiven me. Or a glare or a look with your eyes or whatever it may be that they truly have not forgiven me and this has kind of been like a steady thing in our marriage that we do and you know I like to pick on Ryan my beefcake is what I call him had to throw that out there um but he is one of his um love languages is physical touch and that is not one of my love languages and I'm growing in this and so um, you know he's always said like from the very beginning of our marriage he told you we've been married almost 18 years yeah. he was 19 and I was 21 we were brand new in this thing we didn't have marriage counseling we didn't have even parents or mentors at that time who we confided in um, it was just like hey we're gonna do this thing and we're gonna give it our best shot basically yeah. and through that we've had to do these things um, that we're talking about to have a timeless marriage yeah. but this has been huge in our marriage is forgiveness and Ryan's like okay I hope I know if you have truly forgiven me by doing this one thing I'm like what is the one thing and he's like you seal it with a kiss I'm like of course like this is your love language of course <laughs> you want to kiss your physical touch but at the same time like he knew to a point that if I had not forgiven like when he went out to reach for a kiss on the mouth <laughs> you know like he's and I didn't return it genuinely he knew, like, your words are saying you've forgiven, but your, your heart and your mouth is not showing true forgiveness. And so we've had this thing where we talk about we know we've forgiven each other, and our marriage is by sealing it with a kiss. No, that's so good. And I've got to just come clean to everybody right now that... I just completely made that up because I wanted to get a kiss from my, no, I'm just kidding. It really has been one of those things because just like love is expressed, uh, forgiveness is expressed too. And, and the reason that I shared that thing all those years ago is yes, I did want a kiss from my beautiful wife, but it was also one of those things where if there's still distance there, then you really don't want to come close to each other. And I knew that if she would come give me a kiss, that the distance was gone and we were back on track with that. But in closing this morning, I want to encourage all the, all the married folks out there, all the couples that as we went through these different steps today, one of them may have spoke to your heart. And no matter whether it was, I need to prioritize my spouse or I need to communicate a little bit better, or maybe you're in that place just like Jim was where it just feels like the marriage has kind of come off the rails and it's going in the wrong direction right now that there is one thing above all else that will always be perfect and that will never ever fail and that is God's love. In 1 Corinthians 13 it says that God's love never fails. And so I wanna encourage us all with that today that a big part of God's love is forgiveness. And so no matter which one of those things spoke to your heart, I wanna encourage us all today that if we get in one of those moments with our spouse and, and things are getting off track or we said something that we shouldn't have said or we're just not prioritizing right, whatever it is, be the first one to forgive. Be the first one to say, I'm sorry. Be the first one to say, hey, I recognize there's some distance right now in the marriage. Be the first one to say, you know what? We haven't made time for each other like we need to make time. And here's some things that we can do. And no matter what it is, 
God can bring that thing back together as we speak words of life and use our words to bless and to love our spouse and to really take a step out there and make a decision that, you know what, even if marriage hasn't been great, this is our year. We're going to make our marriage better than ever before and we're going to see God move in our lives because we're going to make God first in this marriage, but then we're going to make each other first right after that. And God, we're going to make the decision to be a couple that puts love first and sees you move in our lives, in our marriage, like ever before. So this morning, I'd like all of us just to, to bow our heads and close our eyes, and I wanna pray for all the married couples uh, that are tuning in today, and also giving an invitation uh, for you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior if you've never done that before. So I'm gonna grab hands with my spouse this morning. If you're, if you're at home, you can do that as well. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, we just come before you today. We thank you. For every marriage that is tuning in this morning, Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for just healing, for restoration, for peace, for greater joy than ever before. Father, I thank you that you're just moving and working, touching every area of their lives and their marriages and their homes. Father, I thank you that you're making it sweeter than ever before. Father, I thank you that love is flowing in those marriages, forgiveness is flowing in those marriages. And Father, because of that, I thank you that your blessing is just resting upon all the husbands and all the wives and all the marriages. And Father, we thank you for it right now. And also, we just want to give an invitation that... If you're hearing this for the first time about this Jesus that can come in and make everything new, and you wanna accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I wanna invite you today to just pray this prayer together with us this morning, and that Jesus can change your life and can change your marriage and get it better than ever before. So let's pray together. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son Jesus. And Father, we thank you that right now, that Jesus Christ is coming into my heart and becoming my personal Lord and Savior. Move in my life and move in my marriage, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we want to thank you so much for tuning in again with us today. Also, we want to leave you that if you did make a decision for the very first time, you can simply text the word decision to 313131. We'll follow up with you this week about the decision that you just made. And not only that, we want to let you know that next weekend is a huge weekend at Word of Life. We've got a guest speaker, Levi Lusco. He's going to be preaching the 830 at our Highland Colony campus. And then he'll be over here at the Lakeland campus for the 10 o'clock and the 1130. It's going to be huge. It's going to be amazing. You don't want to miss it, but please bring a friend, bring family, bring your spouse, bring a coworker, bring somebody with you to service. You don't want to miss it. And then we've got a special treat for all the singles that come in person. We've got a Levi Lusco book that we'll have there for you whenever you leave. So make sure you come, bring somebody, and we will see you next Sunday.